I think we're ready to start and I have a sense you can hear on this microphone, so we'll go. Okay. I'm Megan Marshall, not a poet, but a friend and fan of poets and a biographer of Elizabeth Bishop, who was my teacher in the fall of 1976. <laughs> Almost 50 years ago, I think. I have to get those decades mixed up. Uh, first, I want to thank the Mankiti family and James Fraser for arranging this reading and for their stewardship of the Grolier Poetry Bookshop. Until now, there's been just one place in the world that connects Grace Shulman, Jeffrey Harrison, and me, and that's a villa in the town of Boliasco on the outskirts of Genoa, where at different times, each of us was fortunate to have a five-week residency. Right? The Grolier Bookshop is now the first place to bring the three of us together in person, and its glories are as profound and nearly as historic as any Italian villas could be, although we're in the heart of noisy Harvard Square. So thank you to the Menkides and to James. I'm going to introduce both the poets at the start of the evening so as not to interrupt the reading at the halfway mark. Jeffrey Harrison is the author of six books of poetry, including most recently Between Lakes, which was selected as a 2021 must read book by the Massachusetts Center for the Book and Into Daylight, winner of the Dorset Prize. His first book, The Singing Underneath, was a National Poetry Series winner in 1987, selected by James Merrill. The Names of Things was published in the UK by the Waywiser Press in 2006. A former NEA and Guggenheim Fellow, Jeff Harrison is also a fine prose writer. His essay, The Story of a Box about Marcel Duchamp and Jeff's family was recently published in The Common. I really recommend that essay. Jeff is brilliant with titles, often funny, as with Vermeer Road Trip and Commuter Buddhist, which was set to music by Scott Wheeler, another Boliasco fellow there, brilliantly. His titles draw you into the poem, make you want to read on. And once you're there, you find a distinctive speaker, clear, direct, a master of the observation or insight that you might have come to yourself, though, of course, you never did. But writing is what I know how to do, he tells us half apologetically in essay on a recurring theme, defending his need to write poem after poem about his brother's suicide. And he does know how, even though another poem that plays with its title, Glazing a Window, opens disarmingly. As usual, when I begin, I feel as though I don't know what I'm doing and have to learn it all over again. Of course, he's referring to glazing a window, or is he? I'm grateful to Jeff for the poems he's written and may still be writing about his brother's death and for the wonders in his latest book, Between Lakes, which take us with him into what he calls the vast country of fatherlessness. Loss is not Jeff's only great subject, but it is one of them. Grace Shulman is a new friend, I'm surprised to say, because I feel as if I know her better than almost anyone. Since shortly before the start of the pandemic, we've been speaking nearly every week by phone about our work, our reading, and our lives, mostly our work. We're both rather driven that way. I've been fortunate to hear some of Grace's new poems as she drafted them and to receive her comments on my writing in return. We were introduced by our mutual friend, Emily McKegg, often a third party on our phone calls, who noticed our shared affection for Margaret Fuller, both of us having written on that brilliant New Englander turned Italian revolutionary. In fact, Grace has a long-standing interest in New England writers, some of whom occasionally show up in her poems, although I believe this is the first time she's given a reading in the Boston area. We're lucky to have her here. Wow. Grace is a New Yorker by birth, and except for a few years elsewhere, that city to the Southwest has been her residence ever since. Her resume includes several New York-based credits. She's Distinguished Professor Emerita of English at Baruch College, CUNY, and she was the director of the Poetry Center at the 92nd Street Y for 10 years, 1974 to 84. Grace will be reading tonight from her ninth book of poems, Again the Dawn, 
New and Selected Poems, 1976 to 2022. She too is a master of prose, and I recommend especially her memoir, Strange Paradise, Portrait of a Marriage. For her body of work, she was awarded the Frost Medal for Distinguished Lifetime Achievement in the Arts, and she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She's the editor of the poems of Marianne Moore, the translator from Hebrew of the poems of T. Carmi, and from the Spanish of Songs of Sifar by Pablo Antonio Cuadra. She was poetry editor of The Nation, 1971 to 2006. Edward Hirsch writes of Again the Dawn, Grace Shulman is a poet of brokenness and repair, of baffled mystery, of shatter and luminosity, grief transfigured into joy. Her life's work is a book of wonder. Welcome to Jeff and Grace. Thank you, Megan, for that nice introduction to both of us. And thank you, James, for setting this all up and Grace for asking me to read with you uh, to celebrate your new and selected poems, which is full of luminous poems. Um, I My book is not new. Of course, I do want you to buy it. Here it is. Um, it's, but so I'm going to um, go back and forth between um, the book and newer poems. Um, so I'm going to start with 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 a new a newer poem. But first, I'm going to put my reading glasses on. Make sure you speak right to the mic. Okay, I will. Get it okay. Near your mouth. Once I get started, I think that's the oh, yeah. Um, this is called Laps. Can you hear me? Laps. Oh, no, really okay. Speak. Really speaking the mic. It's called Laps, which hopefully is working at more than one level, and it's set in the Adirondacks on a lake uh, about 50 miles north of Utica, if you know the area, laughs. Not until the next day, when we saw the haze veiling the lake, softening the mossy greens of the mountains on the far shore. And really, not until we picked up the paper at the general store and found the page of maps tracking vast plumes of smoke across the continent, did we catch the ashy odor and grasp that wildfires thousands of miles away accounted for the beauty of the moon we thoughtlessly admired the night before, the shape and color of a mango hanging weightless in the sky? That was actually several years ago, so now when that happens, we know exactly what it is, um, unfortunately. Um, did anybody see the moon tonight on the on the way over? It was really amazing. Yeah. Oh, no. Almost full, pale pink against a sort of oh. blue slate sky. Um, okay. This going back and forth might prove to be a little cumbersome. Okay, so this one is called um, Marsh Grass. Um, <clears throat> and it's one of those poems that's just trying to and every once in a while you see something you've never seen before and you want to describe it, or at least I do, and then see where that takes you. Um, and this this was an amazing effect of light um, near Cape Cod and where in Massachusetts. Um, it's also a shared experience. There's some, um, as I was putting the book together, I realized that there are certain poems that were about shared experiences, which, which I think is what poetry should be too. It's called The Light in the Marsh Grass. The light in the marsh grass was alive, small creatures aglow and crawling one after the other down each tall green blade, thousands of them bending at all angles along the quaggy edge of the salt marsh cove the three of us had paddled our kayaks into. Luminous bits of green gold sliding down the myriad stalks, but inside them, as if the marsh were sucking down the warm light through innumerable living straws, drop after drop in a wavering, steady, mesmerizing rhythm. And for once, no explanation we could think of. 
the unseen ripples on the cove's mirrory stillness focused the focused the late sunlight in eely ribbons that scrolled down the blades of Spartina could diminish the marvel we had chanced upon. And we gave up trying to explain it, gave ourselves to it as if we had ingested some hallucinogen that opened our eyes to what was there all along, but had gone unnoticed, each of us in our own pod of selfhood floating on the fetid primordial cove now held together in odd suspension by these grasses, a swarm with lights that also flowed in waves through us, wanting it not to stop, asking ourselves why we'd never seen what had been going on for eons, asking how we could keep it, knowing we could not. Um, and this, okay, this one is, um, I don't know if anybody saw the show at the Clark a few years ago of Nikolai Astrup, the Norwegian painter. Um, so he should be much more well-known than he is. Um, he's, he did these incredibly vivid um, paintings and woodcuts. Um, the dates were 1880 to 1928. Uh, and so this is about him. Grace has some poems about art and some poems about writers and some poems about music. And there's this, Thing, you know about art sort of engendering other art this is called raw colors for him the glistening streams running down the mountainsides still sang the ancient songs although less audibly than during his childhood when to escape the gloom indoors he climbed onto the turf roof thick with grass and shrubs to pick raspberries under the cloud animated sky. The mountains encircled him like elders less stern than his father, the pastor, who warned him that whatever gave him pleasure was a sin, even sledding and later <laughs> painting. He wanted to wash himself in the region's raw colors and apply them untainted to his paintings and woodcuts. The lake's cobalt, red splash of rowan berries, copper glow of a mountain stone at midnight and for the valleys in spring, his poisonous greens. Anything that hadn't been there when he was a boy, he left out and what had vanished, he added back in the drained marshes yellow with marigolds again. He kept returning to a birch grove like a recurring dream where two of his daughters wearing crimson dresses picked mushrooms bending down in unison as though bowing to the stream rushing by as the foxgloves looked on. Even the boulder topped with moss and frosted with lichen was alive. And the bonfire on Midsummer's Eve was a god of flame leaping high into the vi violet sky, its great plume of smoke snaking over the valley while revelers danced on the mountain's green shoulder and he watched from the edge and took it all in, feeling the heat of the fire on his face. I'm going to read this poem from Megan um, because it's partly about Elizabeth Bishop um, and partly about the Grateful Dead. <laughs> um, Bishop lived in San Francisco for about 18 months in 1968 and 69. Um, uh, you can tell uh, which what's speculation in this poem and what's actual fact, I think. Um, Elizabeth Bishop and the Grateful Dead. Whether, whether she ever saw them perform, we don't know. <laughs> but she did go to a Janis Joplin show. I'm going to start over. I just want to say, this is in rhymed couplets, which is unusual for me. And it's a, there's a, some irregularities too, and um, and some enjambments that's so, it's so much enjambed that you can't really tell in places. Whether she ever saw them perform, we don't know, but she did go to a Janis Joplin show and Tom Gunn's account of smoking a joint with her backstage <laughs> at a group reading makes it easier to imagine her chatting with Jerry during a break about Billie Holiday or Baudelaire or Blake, if not dancing in the aisles during one of the band's already notoriously labyrinthine jams, 
like the one between Dark Star and St. Stephen, a new song in their repertoire that season. He would have been 26, she 57. She might have let it drop that Donovan wanted to record the burglar of Babylon. He might have praised her trippy river man, but she probably wouldn't have uttered the phrase she'd used in one of her unfinished essays to describe the music of a rock band she'd seen several times that year, a fucking machine. <laughs> Though that might have led to a flurry of wit or perhaps a killer rendition of Love Light with Pigpen lewdly rapping in the second set. Unlikely, still I'd like to think it happened. My favorite poet meeting my favorite band. Her partner then was in her twenties and had connections to the music scene. Also in the year and a half, she lived in San Francisco. The dead gave over 65 performances. So you'd think she'd have seen them once. Is that too much of a stretch? Well, this just in. Five or so years later, on one of her trips up to her beloved Nova Scotia, Bishop brought, as a present for her teenage cousin, a copy of Europe 72, a triple album gathered from live concerts, telling him the Grateful Dead was a band to know about, and also that it was okay to smoke pot. Um, scholars are always sort of proud of like discovering fact, new facts. And I think I'm the only person that figured out that it was Europe 72. Um, I don't think anybody really cares. Um, so I'm when I was putting this reading together, I figured out that I had a few newer poems about writers or inspired by writers. Um, this one's inspired by Tony Hoagland and actually by a, a spam email I got from Tony. It's called A Message from Tony Hoagland. We were waiters together at Bread Loaf in 1984. That, that's how we met. A Message from Tony Hoagland. I got an email from Tony just now, that, though he's been dead for a year and a half. And in the instant before my rational brain told me it was spam, I felt the thrill of seeing his name pop up in my inbox, the dopamine rush that he was writing me from beyond the grave. And when I clicked on his name to open the message, the body of the email consisted only of my first name followed by an exclamation mark, as though he was excited to be writing me. And under that, a compressed link and the electric blue that indicated it was live. My giddy fingers slid the cursor over it to see what Tony was sending me. Maybe instead of infecting my computer with malware that would harvest my data and require me to pay a huge <laughs> ransom in cryptocurrency, the link would take me to a web page where I could find all the poems Tony has written since he died. I paused a moment and thought about what those poems would be like but my imagination failed me. Then I clicked delete and went into my trash and deleted the message again, which made me feel timid and puny as though like D.H. Lawrence and his snake, I'd missed my chance with one of the Lords of life. <laughs> which is that last line is a quote from the Lawrence poem. I should have referenced that. Um, and Tony has a great poem called Lawrence. You might want to look that up. Okay, this one's about Kenneth Cope, um, who was my teacher when I was an undergrad at Columbia long, long ago. Um, it's about a dream I had recently, um, and it's totally true. It's called amnesia. I'm not kidding. It's not. It's not like one of those jokes when somebody says this is this is true, and that turns out to be fake. This is totally true. Amnesia. In my dream, someone mentioned. Kenneth Koch's great poem, Amnesia. I don't remember that when I said, but suddenly as though projected on the air, I could see the first few lines. I decided to go home and find the rest of the poem, but couldn't remember where home was. <laughs> when I woke up, of course I was home, but I didn't remember those lines from the poem. And when I looked through Kenneth's books, I didn't find a poem called Amnesia, or even to Amnesia, one of his odes, which might have begun, I'm sorry I forgot to write a poem about you until now. <laughs> Remembering that the internet remembers everything, supposedly, I Googled Kenneth Koch plus Amnesia and found a poem entitled Amnesia in the online magazine Jacket 
by the Australian poet John Kinsella, but dedicated to Kenneth Koch. Weird. Was I still dreaming? No. I liked the poem, but couldn't help thinking it wasn't quite as much fun as Kenneth Koch's amnesia would be. A poem that exists only in my dream and wherever dreams go when you wake up. A poem whose first lines I briefly knew but can't retrieve. <laughs> Though I can picture him writing it in his headlong scrawl, and I won't forget that in my dream, someone, though I can't remember who, called it great, unforgettable. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, this one's brand new, which may mean that I'm gonna regret reading it. Um, I think you'll find, you'll figure out, there's a lot of poets in the audience. I think you'll figure out um, who it's about pretty quickly. <laughs> it's about a um, it's a memory of a of driving through England with my mother and my wife in 1989. <clears throat> Accidental pilgrimage. I was the one behind the wheel when I noticed the road sign for East Coker, so that even <laughs> driving on the left. And having knocked the mirror off the day before, I was able to break and make the sudden turn. <laughs> Somehow I'd hardly thought of it as a real place. But there we were in Elliot's deep lane. I was surprised to see how deep, like a dug trench, its steep banks fringed with ivy and ferns and hinted by hedges, a green tunnel. And alarmed to see how narrow, praying another car wouldn't appear around a blind curve. In my beginning is my end, I remembered aloud to my mother in the passenger seat and my wife in back, but that was as far as I got. In the village, we couldn't think what else to do, but what one does, climb the hill to the little church, in whose apse I was surprised to find a plaque marking Elliot's remains. I'd never thought of him as being buried anywhere, more like a god who was everywhere, and even if flawed, still part of the pantheon. When we came out into daylight, the fields beyond the lichened graves and village rooftops shone a brilliant green. But that was all, no vision of ancient dancers, no revelation. Yet the turn we'd taken to get here was so unexpected it seemed meant to happen, an inadvertent homage that stayed with us as we walked down the hill to find the car and continue on to Devon. It's kind of a challenge to write a poem about a, an incident where nothing really happened. Um, <laughs> but there are really great poems like um, Edward Thomas's Edelstrop that that um, are like that. It, um, I think I'm going to go back to the book for a minute and read. This is a poem um, inspired by a photograph by Gary Winogrand, which if this were a screen, I could put on this, you know, share my screen and, um, but that's the only thing better about Zoom. <laughs> it's called Girl Carrying a Suitcase. And actually I wrote this at Boliasco. It's not, it's not about, it's not, there's no Boliasco in it, but I did write it there. Girl Carrying a Suitcase. Younger in the photo than my daughter is now, 18 or 19. The same age as my wife when I first met her. She would now be not quite old enough to be my mother. More like an older cousin I saw only in summer and would steal glimpses of or find ways to be near. Just as I kept circling back to this girl's photograph at the exhibition to study again the way her body bends slightly to the right to offset the weight of her fabric covered suitcase against the lighter raffia bag in her other hand. The tapered cut of her sleeveless dress printed with black eyed Susans, one centered over a breast and the way her silver bracelets gather at her wrists below the almost dimples on the inside of her elbows, the photos shadowed foci. And since bringing home the postcard I bought at the museum shop I've been searching her image like a figure recovered from my own past, someone I almost recognize, 
though her head is veiled in glare and her hair coming loose from her braids conceals the right side of her face. She gazes downward toward the sidewalk she has just stepped onto from the busy crosswalk, unhurried and alone amid the crowd of the city she is either leaving or returning to, but not arriving in for the first time. She is too unguarded, lost in herself, thinking perhaps of whoever she has just been staying with or is about to visit, someone who, whether cousin, friend, parent, or lover, must surely adore her. If only I could find her and show her this photograph, which almost certainly she has never seen since it was printed for the first time only recently, decades after the photographer's death, or at least sent her this postcard I've been keeping on my desk these last few weeks, giving this stolen glimpse of her past back to her so she too might be taken by this young woman who was once herself, like someone held dear who left long ago, then one late afternoon shows up at the door. Okay, I'm gonna skip that one. Um, this is called Shadow Messages and it's dedicated to the poet Alice, Alison Prine, um, who's, I think it was her second book I chose for a prize a few years ago. Shadow Messages. You sent me your poem about the anniversary of your brother's suicide on the anniversary of my brother's suicide. You couldn't have known and maybe wouldn't have sent it if you had, or maybe you did know and didn't know you knew, your brother having somehow let you know in a way you hardly noticed, a movement of shadows or a rustling of leaves. And maybe my brother will give me a signal, the call of a sparrow, letting me know when to send this to you our brothers working undercover, sending us messages on a frequency unburdened by words. Um, okay, so this is, this is called, this is another dream poem. Um, that's pretty different from the Kenneth Cope one. Um, it's called Double Visitation. There I was with my father again alive, walking around the backyard together, and I hardly noticed it wasn't our backyard or that he looked like he was in his 50s. We were laughing at something, joking around, each comment making us laugh even harder. But then he was crying and I didn't know why, his face contorted, unable to speak. I turned and hugged him and whispered in his ear the words I wanted to say, and he wanted to hear. And as if I had uttered some magic formula, I found myself sitting in a movie theater beside my suddenly alive again brother. The movie ended, and as the credits rolled, we both agreed that it was good. Then I said, but I think I fell asleep for part of it and started telling him the dream I'd had, how our father had visited from the dead and what I'd done and to show him did again whispering those same words to my brother. Um, okay. Okay, this, I think I'll end on this poem. It's called Releasing the Ashes. It's about uh, my mother-in-law's ashes. Um, and it takes place in Marblehead. Uh, releasing the ashes. Scattering would be the wrong word, since your mother's ashes had been packaged in a biodegradable streamlined sleeve of handmade paper, periwinkle blue, designed to be delivered unopened into whatever body of water the loved ones choose, the loved ones choose. In our case, the open sea, a mile off Marblehead on a foggy Sunday morning in August. The owner of the boat we'd hired circled the harbor before heading out, just as 
just as you said your father would have done had he been alive, taking inventory of all the sailboats on their moorings, remarking on their beauty or special features as you did now. Then you spotted one you were sure was his last boat, now renamed, and an invisible passenger joined us. As we passed the lighthouse at the harbor's mouth, the fog was burning off, the day itself waking up, wiping sleep from the rocky islands where cormorants held out their dark wings hierophantically. The buoy that marked the spot we'd chosen, green and red with a seagull perched on top like a rented prop, swayed slightly, its bell ringing uncertainly in a tone not mournful enough for the word toll. The engine now shut down. We rose and fell on mild swells. The water surfaced like a sheet of blue silk billowing in which your brother placed a sleek parcel. It floated there for a minute or so, slowly tipped up on its side, hesitated, then, steeped in its new element, plunged diagonally down like a skate or ray or some other creature, all thin, diving irretrievably away. Thank you. Here, let me help you out. Yeah, okay. Gosh. <laughs> Do you want to stand to read or do you want yeah. to sit? Okay. Okay. It's a joy beyond joys to be reading in an old poetry bookstore, <laughs> looking at books whose spines have the names of Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell and T.S. Eliot, and before this perfect audience, I'm walking on air. Uh, very happy about it. I'll be reading from my new book, Again the Dawn, New and Selected Poems. But I would like to start with a, with a poem I wrote last week. <laughs> uh, never read before, except privately, uh, not to a public audience. It's called Whale, November. On the shore, a low, curved thing. Driftwood, no, closer. A humpback whale, stranded on shore, bloodied by rocks, slate colored with grooves like fluted tile, sparkling in sunlight. There he lay, fins by his side, overcome by ship stripes, the eye, small for his size, wide open, still but glassily unseen, the cavernous mouth shut, a panoply of acorn barnacles stuck to the back, shining like jewels. Just yesterday, I'd seen one like him surfacing, the tail like wings, ready to spurt a fountain spray of steam, fanned by the wind. I could believe that once he was revered a Chinese deity, Hebrew Leviathan, Inuit God, his oval scratched on ancient reddish rock with a prayer for long life. On that day, not yet winter, gulls shrieked above the orange rind of sun, the sky ash white. My sneakers dug in sand, trackless with cracked Ice, as I remembered years back, how you and I ran down to sea, laughing. I thought not much of death, nor after that, until the day you fell, I could not lift you. 
Waiting for the ambulance, I studied your face and touched the bones below your shoulders, covered your long body slowly. Help came faster for the whale, for though police may slight the wounded gull, they'll hurry to attend this large an animal. Waves churned around the giant carcass as Lilliputian workers grappled ropes, and while a crowd looked on, a yellow crane hoisted him up and sent him back to sea for nourishment of smaller fish. At last, flawed from my frozen stare, I turned away. The team obeyed your wish, no respiration. I did not want to hear that you were dead. <laughs> um, Megan mentioned that I lived in New York. I do live in New York, but I also live in Long Island. And uh, this is my pandemic poem. Walking on the seashore, I saw a number of scallop shells uh, and was reminded of uh, pilgrims on their way to the tomb of St. James in the, the uh, Cathedral of Santiago during the plague, the Black Death. They wore scallops, scallop badges on their hats. Um, it's the, the poem is in a, an extended ring of form that I learned from Marilyn Hacker. Um, if it doesn't show, it's even better. But, <laughs> uh, scallop shell. See them at low tide, scallop shells glittering on a scallop edge shore, whittled by water into curvy rows the shape of waves that kiss the sand only to erode it. Today I walked that shoreline, humming Camino Santiago, the road to St. James's tomb where pilgrims traveled, scallop badges on their caps, and chanted prayers for a miracle to cure disease. And so I, stirred by their purpose, hunted for scallop shells shaped like plated fans with mouths that open and close to steer them from predators. I scooped up a fan and blew off sand grains, thinking for that one moment of how St. James's body rose from the sea decked with scallops and of this empty beach in another austere time. Let this unholy pilgrim implore the scallop shell, silvery half moon, save us. This next poem is uh, spoken by not myself, Confessions of a Nun. Uh, the speaker is Sister Jacques Marie uh, Monique Bourgeois. She was a helper of Matisse. Uh, she was an art student, a nurse, uh, a friend, a lover, and um, <clears throat> she left him. Yes, I loved Matisse. He made it for me, you know, this church of glass and fire. Now when the sun rolls rectangles on floors through windows painted yellow, I remember the yellow broom we stumbled through each morning when we climbed this hill and how he stirred to greens in scrub weeds, whites in the anemones and blues 
in the silver of sliver of sea beyond rock terraces. He owned his loves, his vaults, I, his Monique, nurse, disciple, Rose. But who was I? Harsh words we had a few. I had to leave for me myself my holy vows. If I belonged to anything, it was, how could I tell him? Someone larger, il faut y va plus. There must be more. Later, he aged arthritic, waiting for the angel to wound him. None appeared. But when my sisters called for a new chapel, I drew a priest he painted on a wall while belted to his chair. I tied a brush to a long twig, snapped it to his arm, and watched him paint anger in daring strokes. An outsized poppy, the virgin and child, a monk, rage for lost years, for few to come. Why does he think his work is never finished? And yet, he scorned, what is it? Pitié. Not for him. He told me once in wartime, his daughter captured, tortured for her fight in the Maquis. He wept at home alone, all the while painting joy in reds and violets. Now in this blue-green-yellow chapel, seeing the light day sunlight on the sketches of plane tree, Vest, priest, priestly vestments and an altar the color of risen bread. I know at last that just as he held my vows in his great hands, he, godless, will work it out with God. This next poem is called Because. Because in a wounded universe, the tufts of grass still glisten, the first daffodil shoots up through ice melt, and a red-tailed hawk perches on a cathedral spire. And because children toss a fire-red ball in the yard, where a schoolhouse facade was scarred by vandals, and joggers still circle a dry reservoir. Because a rainbow flaunts its painted ribbons and slips them somewhere underneath the earth. Because in a smoky bar, the, two, the trombone blares louder than street sirens because those who can no longer speak of pain are singing. And when on this wide meadow in the park, a full moon still outshines the city lights, and on returning home below the North Star, I see new bricks and glass where the towers fell. And I remember my love's calloused hands soften in my hand while crab apple blossoms showered our laps and a yellow rose opened with its satellite of orange blood buds because i cannot lose the injured world without losing the world i have to praise it Megan and Jeff spoke of uh, and read about Valyasco, which is in Genoa. Uh, and uh, when I was there, I couldn't keep away from a, a vast sculpture garden, which was the Stavino Cemetery, which was quite beautiful. And in fact, today, Megan and I visited the Auburn Cemetery, and I was reminded of the Stalino Cemetery in a way. Um, 
But I'm going to read one of the poems from a sequence I wrote called Alive and Well Tuned Sculptures in the Stalinist Cemetery. And this is called Angel. So this is death, lifelike in marble and unconsoling on a merchant's tomb. No man with a sight, no man at all, but her, slim-hipped in an airy gown, nipped at the waist. On the high breast, one hand rests, the slender fingers limp, waiting to beckon or direct. Come hither, lips, barbed wings, the eyes translucent, clear lakes you would have fathom. But the gaze says, I don't want to be known or understood. Angel of cold passion, angel of sex and death, essential answers hidden in one lamp. When I pass by, she turns to follow. Death, you terrify, just as you lure me with a knowing glance. Another um, Genoa poem. I don't usually read it because it's six minutes long, but with your permission, I will read it tonight. It's called Light in Genoa. When I arrived in Genoa, I realized that my teacher at Bard uh, was a woman named Irma Brandeis, who I found out much later was uh, Montale's friend and lover and partner in Genoa. Montale is from Genoa. Uh, and they loved each other in Genoa. And suddenly I saw before me images in his poems and images that uh, probably they saw together. It was quite a revelation. And this is called Light in Genoa for Irma. Irma Brandeis. Some things come clear only in purest light. In Montali's Italy near Genoa, where the altering sea shimmers at moonrise, I thought I knew her at the hilltop college, her black hair clasped like ecstasy held back, often alone on wall, on walks. She'd named the trees asking an oak unanswerable questions. Green eyes shone sapphire when she spoke of Dante's doomed lovers circling on the wind. I never guessed that she was one of them, but here, gasping at a fresco's angels with sidelong glances that invite the soul, and at erotic sculptures in a cemetery, if the dead could speak, they'd <clears throat> moan in passion. I imagined a rose in her unbound hair. I knew they had been lovers from his poems, that ring of bell flowers quivering in wind, phallic cypresses, and there she is, his Beatrice of the journey that ironically brought her to Italy. Seeking Dante's hell, she met Montale, thought his humor dull, his face unfortunate, but not his lines. So it began their fire. An incandescent late at sunset, a balcony in Genoa, a rocky path, its stones set like mosaics, swims in a cove five years. Then came the shouts that shattered speech when shutters slammed and eyes shut in the sea towns ochre houses 1938 the fascist laws she left and just in time she was a jew montale hear me now life you once wrote is watching a stone wall with cracked glass slivers stuck on top one day I stumbled on a wall like that, high on a mountain terrace, 
and knew that you could never risk the climb or join her leaving these gold hours. Instead, you, you sent remorse and married one who swore suicide if you kept your ecclesia, as you called her, for the water nymph turned sunflower to watch Apollo, the sun god whom she loved in vain, and Clesia turned into Irma, sunflower to moonflower in tailored suits. She never spoke of you. Only in Genoa I've understood that through smart bonds and misery, you'd seen her the way this fire lily breaks through rock at the sea's edge in the unfractured light that is perhaps the hero of your story. Uh, this next poem is called Celebration. Seeing in April, hostas unfurl like arias, and tulips, white cups inscribed with lips of flame, gaze feverish, grown almost to my waist, and the oaks raise new leaves for benediction. I mourn for what does not come back, the movie theater, real spinning out vampire bats, lost trains, the arc of chaplain's cane, the hidden doorways, struck down for a fast food store, your rangy scribe, my shawl of hair, my mother's grand piano, my mother. How to make it new, how to find the gain in it. Ask the sea at sunrise how a million sparks can fly over dead bones. Moon shell. August, I walk this shore in search of wholeness, among snapped razor clams and footless quahogs. How easily my palm cradles a moon shell coughed up on shore. I stroke the fragments as last night I stroked your arm smelling of salt, scrubbed clean by the sea air. Once you loped near me, now in my mind's eye, your rubbery foot soles track sand hills the shape of waves you no longer straddle. You inch forwards, step, comma, pause. Your silence is the wordless rage of pain. But still at night, our bodies merge in sleep and fit unbroken like the one perfect shell I've never found and can only imagine. And crack when we're apart, I clutch the moon shell, guardian of unknowing, chipped and silent, until I fling it down and feel its loss. Broken, it fit my hand and I was whole. Mm. Another persona poem I'd like to read. We never hear God's voice in Genesis. We hear instead somebody who says God spoke but not God speaking directly. So I decided to <laughs> God. <laughs> God speaks. Before the hour I cried, let there be light. 
I tossed out some 300 early versions. <laughs> Revisions help. <laughs> what clatter in the firmament, though, when mountains fell, stars fizzled out. This work is my best, at least for now. <laughs> I called. I named each thing, and it was so. I cannot tell you how, from heaven to seas to people, all sprang up wanting to be. The methods I advise are more precise. Noah's Ark, for instance, go for a wood three stories high, side entrance and a window. Here, when I said the, the waters, oceans rose. Worlds are never finished, only abandoned. <laughs> Yet this one came alive when there were woods for creeping things, dry land for men and women, the evening and the morning. They were good. Creation had been done before, of course, in legend. Same formless waste and darkness, but with one change. The Babylonians have many gods. Always, I work alone. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This next poem. <clears throat> Is called prayer. It's a chazal, eighth eighth century Arabic form, Persian. <laughs> Sorry, Persian. <laughs> Persian form. Wasn't it Arabic also? Khalif was means something different. Persian per, and Persian and, and Urdu. Urdu too. <laughs> well, it's dedicated to. Aga Shahid Ali, who taught us the true ghazal. Um, the odd thing about this ghazal is it's a Yom Kippur ghazal. Um, <laughs> uh, when I was at Baruch, when I was teaching and school was out, I used to go to the shore instead of what I should have been doing, going to observe the high holy days. I went to the sea and not without some guilt. Uh, and I thought about it. I thought about you know, Yom Kippur wearing a bride's dress bought in Jerusalem. I peer through swamp reeds, my thought in Jerusalem. Velvet on grass, odd, but I learned young to keep this day just as I can if not as I ought in Jerusalem. Like sleep or love, prayer may surprise the woman who laughs by a stream or the child distraught in Jerusalem. My Arab dress has blue, green, yellow threads, the shades of mosaics hand wrought in Jerusalem that both peoples prize like the blue yellow dome of the rock, like strung beads and clothes said to ward off the draught in Jerusalem. Both savor things that grow wild, Coriopsis in April, the rose that buds late like an afterthought in Jerusalem, while car bombs flared, an Arab poet translated Hebrew verses whose flame caught in Jerusalem. And you, Shahid, sail you the Halevi Sea as I on Galib's course like an Argonaut in Jerusalem. Stone lions pace the, the Sultan's gate, while almonds bloom into images, Hebrew and Arabic, wrought in Jerusalem. No words, no metaphors. For knives that gore flesh on streets where the people have fought in Jerusalem. As this spider weaves a web in silence, may Hebrew and Arabic be woven taught in Jerusalem. 
here at the bay, I see my face in the shallows and plumb for the true self our Abraham sought in Jerusalem. Open the gates to rainbow colored words of, of outlanders, the sounds untaught in Jerusalem. My name is Grace, Kata in Hebrew and in Arabic. May its meaning, God's love, at last be taught in Jerusalem. <laughs> this next poem is called Waves. The burst, the lilt and rock, the wheel of spray, the flash of waves exploding in hard rain. Perhaps they are the dead, their watermark, the signatures of shipwrecked passengers or coded messages from men and women desperate to tell what they have seen. Speed, thunder, surprise, the jarring thump of low bass drums. The dancers leap and bow. The gospel singers growl. The pause, the shout, dodging the beat, notes jammed with, with syllables. The hums, mumbles, and cries. The choruses, symbols that gleam in sudden white gold light. Breakers roared when Cadman sang creation in a new verse with a rhythmic pull of oars. Rollers boom on a shore I cannot see and tie me to flood dead, quake dead, war dead, disaster dead or dead ripped from the stars. As I trudge in the shallows, shift sliding in rack, order snapped apart like a broken string, each end still aloft, trembling in air. The sea ahead, the roadways drawn behind. A wave shimmers, taking its time to fall. How all that matters is to stand fast on the ridge that's left and hear the music. Uh, that poem reminds me that one of my favorite subjects is jazz and my main man is Miles, Miles Davis. And my other main man is Thelonious Monk. And here goes Blue and Green. Blue and green. Bay water seen through grasses that quiver over it, stirring the air, slanted against the water's one end dashes. Each blade is a brush stroke on thin rice paper. Unrehearsed, undrafted, no revision, right on the first take. In blue and green, on tenor sax, John Coltrane filled the blues with mournful chords on scales older than jewels, ending in air. He'd not played it before that recording, with that piano and bass rising alone and birds in flight together, right on the first take. Improvisation, he called it, but it must have been foreseen. Like the painter's brushstroke, a wrong line could block the composition, snag the paper. It had to be unstudied like a turn's cry and natural like a rope's clink 
on a mast with wind as bass player, huge and invisible. If only I could remember the past without regret, for the windrose petals fall, for words unspoken and without remorse, for love's withheld rough draft mistakes. If only my heart could teach my hands to play and get it right <laughs> on the first Mm -hmm. uh, this poem is called The Vow, and uh, I had a very good marriage for a long time, but the worst thing about it was the ritual of marriage, which seemed awfully primitive to me. <laughs> um, and uh, after it was over, everything was fine, but uh, that marriage ceremony was too much. It's called the vow. <laughs> that day I stepped gingerly with my father playing father. Actors <laughs> played their parts down the blue carpeted aisle to be wed or tried for treason. A skeletal pianist fingered a funeral march hitting wrong notes. <laughs> we passed mom in a dress size too large she bought to play the mother of the bride. My own type bodice pinched as I gasped for breath, bound for a new life knowing the old would do. I glanced upward at friends playing hope my roses drying brown as I neared an altar set too high and built a rotting pine. My father gave this woman, me, to some imposter who would want me to be faithful as Ruth, which meant, I suppose, to follow my mother-in-law whither she goes. <laughs> yes, I wanted this, but want is a moment in a long sentence without punctuation. <laughs> what if some, if like some birds, I could not sing in captivity? Would it be, I pleaded, security or maximum security? <laughs> Divorce would disappoint my grandmother, crying here for joy in silk chiffon. And then at last I saw him the one who wasn't playing anyone, his eyes hazel, shining like Aggies in first light. And I said, yes, of course, I will. I will. <laughs> oh, I'll read, John. Just one more poem. Let her be. The letter B. In the beginning was the letter B. <laughs> Through it, God made the world. Today, that sign gleams on a keyboard for neither cadenzas nor waterfall arpeggios, but for prayers tapped out on keys that flicker like strung beads, paper thin, like pearly yellow seashells tide washes in. I long for rate weightier strokes by surer hands with trowels that dug out, dug, out, dug out sand, be at the base. For the bee that blooms now, curved like a bellflower in high wind, a Phoenician sailed the blood of faith to the Greeks for Bita centuries ago. B is for BCE, for Nestor's cup, for the stone scratches on a burial urn, and for Babel's blankness when our language languages were undone. B is for bare winters of the untaught, for slave songs bellowed out on a free night, 
and for the blessed who learned to write them down. B is for Hector's burial and for the and for the binding, sorry, for the bending of angry Achilles, who, when he remembers his own dead father, he will not see again, gives up the body, and the Trojans buried Hector, breaker of horses. B is for barbed rage, and for the bond between one and another, and how the two unfold like buxom curves of the letter B, and how, braided together, they brew words benign and bellicose, brash and believing. Bits of ourselves strewn, rooted over time. B, the blaze of black fire on white fire. The Torah's letters. Blares at the center, bottom row, where my lines are born. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Let's give Grace and Jeffrey another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Both personnel and the poets will be signing books. Uh, if everyone could please just help by moving your chair up against one of the walls, that would be great. Thank you so much. Probably blended, and I feel transfixed. And I was going to find your We're supposed to be at a dinner table in 15 minutes, 15 minutes away. Um, thank you. I know yours is here. Um, it's, 